Hallelujah. Father, we thank you so much for your servants. Pastor Barbara Gatson, Minister Ann Waston, and Apostle Candace Star, and all the brethren who, along with them, uphold the Wednesdays of the week in prayer. Thank you for what you're doing in our midst. Thank you for the ministry of the blood of the Lamb and the ministry of the Word. Thank you for the guidance by Holy Spirit. As we continue our study on the fivefold today, and as we look into the fivefold office of pastor, we ask for your revelation to come forth. We ask for understanding. We ask for your grace. Have your way. In Yeshua's mighty name we pray. Amen and amen. Men and brethren, we continue our ongoing study on the fivefold. And today we go on to the office gift of pastor. Who is a pastor? The pastor is a minister who is called by Yeshua himself. Minister called by Yeshua himself and vested with the authority to nurture. To nurture. And nurture means feed and care for. Feed them, care for them. So Vesta with authority to nurture the flock committed to his or her trust. So he or she is in effect an under-shepherd of Yeshua. Yeshua is the great shepherd. Now the pastor is the under-shepherd with the grace and capacity to lead the flock to find good pasture in him, not outside of him. So again, the pastor is a minister who is called by Yeshua himself, vested with the authority to nurture the flock committed to his or her trust, so that in effect, the pastor is an under shepherd of Yeshua that leads the flock to find good pasture in him. He is the center and circumference of their lives. And the more they grow in him, the more they become independent of the pastor. Not independent in a negative sense, but in the sense that they are no longer codependents. The pastor is therefore to be adept in two things. Using the staff to lead the saints in the right direction of life. And two, using the rod to chasten or correct saints when they are out of order. The rod and the staff. The staff to lead, the rod to chastise. Ability to excise both with graciousness and excellence of spirit is at the heart of the call of the pastor. The office is especially sensitive because it is the very one that has been ordained to care for the flock and ensure proper nurturing so that all saints are protected, all saints are preserved, and all saints grow in grace. There are examples in the scripture in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, it epitomizes the role of the pastor, the shepherd of the flock. And that's why in Jeremiah 3.15, the Lord says, and I will give you pastors according to my heart and which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. I will give. Elohim gives. Pastors, it is very important that in the model of the kingdom church, whose emergence will precede return of the Lord, the pastor is not automatically the leader of the congregation where he or she serves. Not automatically. That the pastor is the leader of the congregation where he serves. So listen to this, and that sounds very funny, but that's the truth. In the fivefold based ministry, the pastor is the nurturer, but not necessarily the leader. If there's an apostle in the house, a prophet in the house, they are senior in the pecking order of the kingdom to the pastor. His job is to nurture. We're going to come to that. And so, the pastor may not be the instrument Yeshua uses to start the church as in a visionary. The pastor may not be the most charismatic or the most anointed. He may not be the oldest or the strongest. But he's the one with certain qualities that will enable them to connect with the sheep at the heart level and ensure that the sheep is empowered and preserved. So what are the roles of the pastor in the fivefold? Let's take a few things. Number one, the first is to prayerfully seek that Yeshua who raised the missing of his gifts within the fold until it becomes a complete fivefold assembly. Now we're talking about roles in the context of Ephesians 4, 11 to 16 because that is the main scripture 
what you call the anchor scripture of the fivefold. So if somebody is a pastor, before you do any other thing, you recognize that your fold alone, your gift and calling, your grace and anointing alone cannot perfect the church, cannot perfect the saints. And so you yearn for the other folds to arise because you are not threatened with the arising. You are content with your own calling. So what happens, therefore, if the pastor is now sees the congregation deficient, he prays about it, is open to the Father, being using him or her to bring the fivefold into existence. So he can use the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm to train up the people, and among them will emerge a prophet, will emerge an evangelist in the house. Most times pastors have dual uh, grace of pastoring and teaching. Some people have argued it's only fourfold. We don't want to get into those semantics. Somebody can have two, two gifts or three of his gifts, yes. So the pastor can bring about the fivefold, can be used to bring about the fivefold by praying about it and using the teach, train, equip, activate, and release paradigm to bring it to pass that people within the congregation take their place. Then number two, since that takes time to happen, we're still talking about that first, this first point of playing a role in the emergence of the fivefold, the pastor who has a passion for the flock will become part of a ministerial fellowship where the fivefold are in operation. And then what will happen? Within the fold, I mean within the network, the Holy Spirit begins to show him that apostle, that prophet, that evangelist, or even that teacher who has something that the flock need. And he comes alongside and then in drawing up the church program for the year, he doesn't put people to come and preach who are friends. He wants to, you know, you want to rub their back and they rub your back. No, you know what the flock need. You carry the heart of the Father. So you now invest in that process. And part of it is to see those who have what you don't have and bring them in within the network that you belong. And if you have not a network, if you are watching this program, you are not part of a ministerial network, or the one you belong to does not know and believe the fivefold, well, come take a look at IMF called imfministers.com. IMF, International Ministers Fellowship, imfministers.com. That's our fellowship. And if you want to connect in any nation, you're going to find apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And so you can find grace you can tap into who have things you need. And then number three is the father can also, if you have a large heart, let's say you're a pastor and teacher, you know that the people, if they don't have the input of the apostle and prophet and evangelist, they're going to be babes perpetually. They're not going to grow. They're not going to have spiritual muscle. The Father can show you an apostle and a prophet, an evangelist you can connect with, that can be connected with you. They are not necessarily in-house officers, but they are connected by covenant that you tap into the grace in them. Well, these things are all, we have not come to the main roles, he said, but we are talking about playing a role in emergence of the fivefold, the pastors can do a great work. So there are four relevant questions that a pastor must ask himself in order to be truly a pastor. Number one, the people the Father has brought to you, what did Yahweh create them to be? Who did he create them to be? What is the purpose of their creation? If you don't ask that question, you cannot truly be their pastor. Two, why, what did, you know, why did Yeshua redeem them? What were they created to be? Why were they redeemed? Three, what are the gifts of Holy Spirit that are in them? You got to ask those questions continually concerning the people. Otherwise, you will not see. They'll be near you. You will see what is in them. You don't look at them as trees, as statistics, as a whole membership of the church. You miss it. And number four, what is their specific role in the body wherein you are part of? And in the kingdom at large, four questions. What or why did Yahweh create them, the Father? Two, why did Yeshua redeem them? Three, what are the gifts of Holy Spirit that are inside of them that need to be activated? Four, what is their, why, or what is their specific role in the congregation and in the body, the kingdom? 
If you don't ask these questions, you will not do well. You will not be able to give them the full nurturing they need to be because they are not in the church to fulfill your dream. They are in the church that through you, Holy Spirit will do a work in their life. Now, this is a sensitive function which inspires confidence of the flock. We need to say this, of all the fools, the one that has the greatest sensitivity that ought to see the innermost makeup of the people is the office of pastor. The one that ought to connect heart to heart is the pastor. The one that should be touched with the feeling of the infirmities, just like Yeshua is touched with the feeling of our infirmities, is the pastor. The one that people are weeping, they are weeping. They are bleeding inside. They are laughing. They are joy. Oh, you have shared the joy with them because of the connection. It's not natural. It's spiritual. Elohim did it. There's a wire inside. That is why the more you be a pastor, to keep an open home, the idea oh, you you know you are not able to keep an open home because your red wine carpet, your red wine carpet or rug, your Persian rug, you don't want people to mess it up. You are in the wrong, you are in the wrong calling, you are in the wrong fold. Some can afford that, if at all is permitted. But the pastors cannot. You can't keep too much barrier. Oh, secretary, PA, personal assistant, they have to go through to touch you. If people have to go through that kind of layers of protocol to assess you, because you've learned about protocol in Bible college and you want to play protocol with only 75 people, only 50 people, only 100 people, something is wrong. Yeah, people should have access to their pastor. If it's truly their pastor, the one the Lord sent to nurture them, they should be able to come. Even if, or even under pressure, they didn't have an appointment, they should be able to crash. And you attend to them because your love covers the multitude of their inadequacies. So this is such a sensitive office. It is not a title to be bestowed on brothers and sisters who are kind or gentle or compassionate. It's not a reward given for loyal service in a church. It's not a political position that can be attained by votes of the presbytery or by deaconate voting or by the executive search committee looking for. It's not a professional employment for which you are, the, the salary, the tenure is what is driving you. They look you out and then you come into the middle class or lower upper class. No. Those things are going to make the pastorate a very terrible thing. Men and brethren, it's so important that of all the fold, the one the Father has wired with the spiritual, emotional, and physical felt needs of the people is that of the officer. It's, it's that of the pastor. It's deep, it's intense. So that is what makes them an under-shepherd, carrying the heart of Yeshua, the great shepherd, to the flock. And brethren, <clears throat> because of this, the father wants the pastor to be the one that through the way they connect, through the way they nurture, the people can see the fatherhood of Yahweh in flesh and blood so that they can believe his fatherhood. A lot of people are from broken homes. A lot of people are from dysfunctional backgrounds. A lot of people have all kinds of issues, inner healing issues, and they come to church in arrested babyhood syndrome. At that stage, what they need is nurture. What they need is care. What they need is love. And those things can come from one who is truly called and gifted to be a pastor. You come alongside them. You win their confidence because of the way you care for them. The way you take care of their details of them. You look at their, the, the, the color. Is this crawfish? You are the one that will call them in love, pull them and say, you know, that your tie, this is the way to put it. The one that can look at them and ask, did you have your breakfast today before coming to church? Where, where, where would the prophet stay to ask you that kind of question of evangelist? They can't see those things, but the pastor can see that this one has not had a meal. The pastor can see that this one is stressed out and will begin to think about what to do to solve it. So it's a very sensitive function, men and brethren. And we're going to go into the second part of it the office of pastor, the charge, signs, and pitfalls. Brethren, let us understand that the pastoral anointing comes from Yeshua, the great shepherd himself. That's why he imparts the grace in him, the one who could care for the flock. We are told 
that he went about all the villages in Matthew chapter 9, 35 to 36. He went about the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitude, he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Pastors who are truly called, they don't just, it's not just give the word. They want to know about the holistic well-being, spirit, soul, body. That's the one that will look at his sister and call the sister and say, Sister, I see your faithfulness and your commitment and your zeal. Uh, uh, sister, are you thinking about marriage? You know, is the Lord leading this way? That they can open such difficult conversations. They look at their brother, look at him, the way he functions and say, Brother, can I ask you a question? You know, do you take time to take care of the needs of your wife and the children. The grace in them enables them to carry the heart of King Yeshua, the great shepherd, without causing offense, nurture, care. So in that regard, it's so important that we realize the charge that was given to Peter. Peter was a man who had faced real process. So Peter wrote a very powerful epistle that we want to look at a little bit more. First Peter 5, verse 1 to 4. The elders which are among you. I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Yeshua, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. And he gave the charge. And by verse 2, feed the flock of Elohim, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not with free to look at, but of a ready mind. Neither has been lords over Elohim's heritage, but being examples of the flock. When the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that faded not away. Let's take some principles from this charge by Peter. Number one, the flock is entrusted by Yeshua to the pastor. They are not your own. You didn't create them. You didn't redeem them. They are created by Elohim. Yeshua redeemed them. And he has entrusted them to you. That is serious. Men and brethren, to understand that they don't, they are not your member. In fact, it is wrong for pastors to say, my member. It's a wrong statement. I don't know how much I can say this, brethren, to you all. Don't call anyone redeemed by the blood my member. It is something that is a little bit shocking in the extreme. Why? They are his members. They are members of his body. So, they are entrusted to you. They are not owned by the denomination. They are not owned by the local assembly. They are owned by him. He has made you a caretaker of them. So, a pastor should never lose sight of this foundational truth. If we understand that just as us, we, they are all children of the same father. Elohim has no grandchildren. So pastors must take away the mentality that we are the son of Elohim. They are your sons. If you have that mentality, you will not be able to look at them with empowering mind. You look at them with minds that they are perpetually babes and they will never grow in you. So it will enable you to really be open to sincere work with the Father so to receive grace to nurture these people because he who called you and gave you the assignment, he has also given enough grace. It will enable you to esteem their soul highly. It will enable you to see to their holistic welfare. Number two, from this charge in 1 Peter uh, uh, chapter 5, the saints are to be cared for. The saints are to be cared for. Peter says, take care of the flock. What does this mean? Your entire pastorate is about them, not you. Just as in business, they say customers are our business. The customer, the first thing you learn as a customer relation officer is that the customer is king. So don't care about his tantrum, don't care about his attitude. He has money in his pocket you need. You have product to give to him and take. So you know what? Bear with him and make sure that exchange takes place. He gives you his money, you gives him the good, then the business prospers and we're able to pay you salary. In the same way, hey, pastors, their flock are the reason for your pastorate. No flock, no pastorate. No sheep, no pastorate. Hey, if you get this well 
and shift your attitude as one who appreciates that you are sent to nurture these people. It's something you are sent to care for them and you make them the issue, not yourself. You are not going to be allowing your own little issues, your own inner healing issues, your own insecurities to get in the way of the work you are sent to do. And men and brethren, this is so important. And we got to say it is so important. The very thing we call dysfunction in the saints are the very reasons why Yeshua sent you as a pastor in their life. That's why he empowered you. So with humility, with patience, with compassion, with care, with focus and sensitivity, you can apply the healing balm of Gilead to their heart, to their mind, to their will, to their emotion, and bring them up. So the saints are to be cared for. Three, pastors are to watch over the flock with willingness. Do the pastoral work with willingness of mind. Don't be as one who is pushed by elders, pushed by presbytery, who is pushed by what people will say. No, you are you're doing the work as unto the Lord. Do it willingly. Embrace it. Have, have, have an effervescence in your spirit. Do it with the joy of the Lord. Do it with willingly, not constraint. There, you know, it is so important. If you are willing, <clears throat> we are told in Proverbs 27, 23, be thou diligent to know the state of thy flock. Look well to the heart. So true pastors cannot afford the sin of indifference. There's a sin called indifference. True pastors cannot. False are shepherds who see danger coming and they run away, like John 10 says. But you know what? Pastors, when they design a situation, let's say a brother begins to walk disorderly. Every time church finishes, he wants to go and talk to a particular sister. He wants to touch her. He wants this, he wants that. A pastor cannot be indifferent to that. He cannot say, well, it doesn't matter whatever they can take. No. The pastor is a shepherd. You frown. Yeah. He hears about sister doing wrong visitation, 9 p.m., 10 p.m., going to the home of a brother. brother. No, pastor, don't, be, don't do as if it doesn't matter. No, there's a scene of indifference. You know, you got to watch over people's life. And you can see trends from afar, and you can raise alarm early. You can take it up with the people concerned. Men and brethren, number four, the motives of pastors must be pure. The pastoral assignment must be done with purity of motive. Pure heart, pure motives. There's no agenda. You are there to watch over their souls. You are there to nurture them. You are there to care for them. That must be the overriding thing in your heart. Number five, pastors are not to lord it over the saints. You are not there to play boss. You are there to be shepherd. So, what does it mean? In certain situations like career, like marriage, who to marry, or which career to go, don't interject yourself so much and use prophecy and use what you think to now impose on people a solution. No. Even the younger ones who are in school, you know what? Don't interject. There are many young people's lives are shattered because their parents or their pastors wanted them to be this or that or that profession and push them there, but they don't have the grace. They are living in regret. All over the world is a trend. So don't, don't, listen, the Elohim who sent you does not interfere with the will of his creation. One of the things Elohim does, he doesn't interfere with the will. He will show you, he will guide you, he will never interfere with your will. So pastors must learn the fine art, teach them the truth, guide them, but don't make decisions for them. Even if they come for counseling, go through things with them. And lay before them life and death. Lay before them options. Lay before them and let them, when it comes to decision, let their will be part of it. Otherwise, if you lord it over them and let them do your will, they may miss the will of the Father. Number six, pastors are to lead by example. Don't ask people to do something and you stay back. Don't ask people to fast and pray and you are there is eating and drinking. Don't ask people to go on evangelism, and you are there, you won't go on evangelism. Don't ask people to do anything, and you can't do it. Don't ask people to give, and you yourself, you don't give. And the people know if their leader is a giver or not. Don't exclude yourself from the life of the church. You are an example to the flock. 
if you able to do something, they see it's doable. Then they will go with you. They, it's easy to lead people when you yourself have an experiential encounter with the Lord that makes you a doer of whatever you teach or preach. If you're a doer, it's easy to lead the people because they can see you. Don't tell people, go in and you sit down. Year in, year out, you sit down because you're a pastor. Who told you that pastors cannot evangelize? Paul told Timothy, do the work of an evangelist. Let them see you go to the mall. Let them see you go to the hospital. Let them see you visit the sick. Let them see you do some of those things. Let them see you, your, your vacation. You take part of your vacation and say, well, you know what? I'm going to pray and walk Washington, D.C. My vacation, out of two weeks, I'm going to stay. I'm going to stay in Maryland. It's cheaper there. I'm going to get a hotel there. I'm going to rent a car. I'm going to pray and walk over D.C. I'm going to turn my convention, my vacation into ministry. Let them see you do that. They'll be challenged to think likewise. And then number seven, every pastor must be conscious of the fact that judgment day is coming. A day is coming. That's what Peter was saying. A day is coming when we appear before the Lord to account for how we live. And Paul already told us in 1 Corinthians 9, 24 to 27, let's not just lead others, your soul. Don't neglect the garden of your own soul while you're tending the soul of other people. Because if you tend your own garden of your soul, and come to the place of consecration and commitment. Come to the place of loving the Lord with all your heart and receiving grace to love people. Then out of that grace can you minister. Men and brethren, Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy 4, 6 to 8, I'm now ready to be offered. And the time of my departure is at hand. I've fought a good fight. I've finished my course. I've kept thy faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness with the Lord. The righteous joy shall give me on that day, not to me only, but unto all them that love is appearing. We are told in 2 Corinthians 5.10, we will appear before the judgment seat of Yeshua. A pastor must always bear that in mind. How did you handle this? How did you treat matters? Oh, did you get to that brother? You treated this matter differently in that one? You treated it differently because this one does this or that for you? No. We have to be careful. The judgment seat is there. Now, let's look at the signs and privileges of pastoral ministry. What do you see in a brother or sister in the church? Or one of the ministers you know, this one is called. What is it that you should be looking out for? Number one, a tendency. You see, listen, there are certain privileges and signs that pastors are given. One of them is a tendency to yearn for perfection of saints for their kingdom assignment. It is part of the calling of the fivefold to perfect the saints. So when you see a saint who is not only is the saint is growing in himself, is growing, growing in leaps and bounds, and is also interested in the growth of others, interested in their perfection, is able to help on Sunday school class, is able to help people look out for get for the Bible where they should find that reference, and able to help people make out time to help people to grow along. When you see that, you know, one, it's a sign. And it's also a privilege of the office. Two, look at this. Among the ministers, the pastor is the one that ties up and channels the anointing, the impartation that comes from the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the teacher. The pastor is the one that ties it up and channels it, breaks it down, what the apostle say, what the prophet say, what the evangelist say, what the teacher is saying, breaks it down, ties it up, channels it to feed the flock holistically. So the flock get the vitamin, the protein, the carbohydrate, and all the amino acids and all that. Number three, the pastor is the minister who shares the closest proximity with the saints. And this great proximity loves to be with the saints, loves to sit with them, ask them questions. Number four, the pastor is the one, therefore, who can reach deep into the spirit and soul of the saints and establish a real heart connection. A connection. Both heart and connection. The love is so genuine that people find that this one knows, loves them. Number five, the pastor is thus able to win the confidence of the flock to a profound degree which enables them to be open at their most basic level. When pastors engage with people, they can get somebody who is a clam to open up. Because the love they manifest, the connection, 
The sense of genuine care makes people to know that this one is a friend indeed. This one is a, a pastor indeed. Number six, the pastor has greater grace to minister to the sheep as individual members of the body. The pastor goes beyond the overall, goes beyond the statistics, goes beyond that supra thing to see the individual as an individual that needs specific nurture and care. So, having said these things, let's look at pitfalls to avoid the pastoral ministry. Number one is misuse of confidential information. People are going to come to you as a pastor. People are going to open up to you. People are going to share deep things with you. Let it not be said that something shared with you on a Thursday or Friday become the object of a sermon on Sunday. No. Especially if it's a pointed one. Please, if you're a pastor, just know that people are raw inside. So they can easily tie two together and they think, well, it's not worth opening up. But having said that, on the other hand, please also know that, especially in the Western world, Europe and America, there are people who come to you once you're a new pastor. Within three, four, five weeks, they want to tell you certain things about them, and they are not telling you that they are sincerely opening up to you. They want to close your mouth so that you will never talk about such things. Such issues that are doctrinal, important things. So you must distinguish between people sharing confidence with you and you're not making a subject of, of someone, and people trying to close your mouth by by falsely opening up, and the whole idea is to make you not to talk about certain kind of sins in the church. Now, the second pitfall to avoid is bearing malice or exercising discipline with malice. You are going to be leading people. Now, if for any reason you don't like somebody, the person may feel it. So, if you don't like somebody, and for that reason, anything concerning that person, you make it more difficult. Remember that the Lord sees your heart. He knows. If you have malice, you have brought yourself down to the level of that person as even lower. So you must learn to forgive people swiftly, fully, completely, justify them so that you may be able to pastor them and nurture them properly. Okay, number, number three, feeding fat of the sheep. Don't see them as objects, finance, source of income. If you do that, make your God your belly. If you are driven by what you get from people, it will make you to modify scripture, handle the word of Elohim deceitfully, and that will not be one or good. Number four, taking on the advantage of vulnerable members of the congregation. There will be people in your congregation who are elderly, who need your support for their pension, for their gratuity, for certain things. And if you are now covetous and because of that confidence they are vulnerable, they've surrounded things to you and you begin to, you know, take advantage of that. You see the, some such stories all over the world, somebody's pension being tampered with, other things, you know, agreements being tampered with, will being tampered with. The moment you begin to do that, you know that that's the spirit of Judas Iscariot who dipped his hand in the, in the pocket. Don't take undue advantage of vulnerable members of the congregation. Or maybe people of the opposite gender, they come to you for counseling and they begin to insert yourself into their soul rim. And before that, you become solutionally attached and you begin to get emotional satisfaction from that attachment or even defilement. No, because somebody, let's say people quarrel, a husband and wife quarrel, and then you enter in. Instead of trying to get them come together, you begin to feed one person to feel that person is the better part. And before you know it, you insert yourself and you are the one now supplying the lack in that person. No, that's a vulnerable person. You handle with care. Vulnerable people. Number five, not empowering the flock. There are some pastors who love the flock in a negative way. They now will to cover them. They look at the people. They never believe they've grown. They look at what they are seeing is the man they saw five years ago, three years ago, raw, and they never see. So they never have confidence to give them assignments to do, to give them assignments to grow. Someone has been in church for seven years, and once he has never gone to the pulpit, what is wrong? 
seven years in a church and never gone to the pulpit to even bring a greeting or pray or, or, or take offering. No. If he's shy, break that shyness by giving him assignment. Pray for him. Confirm him. We are called to nurture the priesthood of all believers. And that will require empowering people as we see grace upon them. Not everyone is called for the pulpit. For those who are called to deconnect, let them serve. Give them more rims of scope of liberty to make decisions about service, about taking care of things. Don't sit on people. Number six, seeing the saints as perpetual babes needing protection. Perpetually are making decisions for them. When will they grow? You need to give them some patience, even eagles. In training their eaglets, we are told that eagles take the eaglet to the top of the mountain and then they leave the eaglet alone. And then in that state of free fall, the eaglet remembers how the mom used to raise the wings. So when that eaglet is falling at a certain stage, it just opens the wing, only to discover that the air will carry. Then they learn to fly. If you overprotect them because you see them as babes always, you are killing them slowly. Number seven is territorial mindset. Sometimes pastors tend to forget that the congregation they lead is just part of the body of Yeshua in the city, in the nation. Territorial mindset is what makes you to see them as your own. You never want them to interact, never want them to relate. And scare mongering, fear mongering, the extent is that they only see that church as the church. And that leads to a denominational mindset. The territorial mindset of the pastor can affect the people and the flock begins to think territorially. And the territory becomes just that four walls of the church. No. Teach your people where the body. Teach them what the body is, the grace in the body. Teach them to be able to design. So when they go for a revival and a big name is there, certain things they will do, they know that these people have come with their crafty wares. Teach them how to also tap into the body without feeling obligated. One of the things we tell people, anywhere there's a manifestation of the Lord's presence and you are there, tap into grace without getting attached to people. And don't let anybody make you now a client because grace has been released. If something rises, that person is fleshly. Beware. Number eight is getting into cultural issues in a negative way. It works two ways. Number one is there are those who see their pulpit as bully pulpits to bash government, bash president, bash governor, bash senators, bash everybody. You have all the solution. And your pulpit is just negative. And especially if the man in office, you don't like his face, you don't like his politics, you now turn the pulpit into a bully pulpit abusing. You can get it to the extent you begin to you know, make many people in the congregation uncomfortable, uneasy, and they begin to drift away from you, lose confidence in you. The second part of it is even more dangerous. So while the other one is bashing, criticizing, be, not being under authority, the other one is where you now turn the pulpit into a megaphone of somebody in office. Either a governor, a mayor, either a president, anything he says, you amplify it on Sunday. You don't know that politicians are crafty. They can say anything to win approval of people. So what they are saying with their lips may not, their heart may not be there. And so they say this, they throw it like firecrackers. Then you carry it on Sunday, you amplify it. You now quote pastor. I mean, you quote governor, president, not Yeshua. Before you know it, every, their agenda is your agenda. You become guilty by association. If there's any secret connection between that person and the occult or that person on the powers of darkness or whatever, you become a partaker. You idolize a human being. You idolize a political system because uh, the cultural issues raised are important to you. Oh no, these two things are mess, absolute mess. And all over the world, pastors are falling into either of these attacking government, or either of these idolizing government. It is dangerous. The father said, come out from Eve. Come out from Babylon, oh my people. The church is the salt of the earth. The church is the light of the world. If you go and get into the trenches, you are like, you're cast out. You lose your savor. Either way, attacking, idolizing, you lose your savor. Men trample you underfoot. The church loses its focus. The light becomes darkness and people are misguided. So pastors guard the pulpit. Sanctify the pulpit. 
Guard your work. Guard your assignment with diligence. Don't make a mess of the calling of the Father upon your life. You know what? Tomorrow we'll continue. I want to say to you, brethren, we love you so much and we want to see what the Father has shown us. Starting from the time he began to teach us about the fivefold, that the Omega Church, without spot or wrinkle or other such thing, it will come through the synergistic ministry of the fivefold. And so whichever fold the Father has called you, make room for the other fold. Look out for them or empower the flock to come into those fold so that working together, for we are better together in the kingdom. Pastors, your work is so critical. You carry the heart of the Father more than any other one. The saints open up to you more than any other person. And represented by this finger, the fivefold, the apostle has grace, to manifest any of this. Most apostles manifest each of these graces. The pastor tosses the Lord, the one that points. The evangelist, the one that gathers the greatest crowd. The pastor, the one that nurtures, the one that cares, the one that, you know, he can raise issues with people without threatening them because the love knows. The teacher, the one that rightly divides the word. And we're saying to you, whichever fold you are called to, look out for the other fold. Make room. If you make room, the Father will manifest them. Empower the people. Don't sit on their grace. Don't look at them with the eye of yesterday. Look at them with the eye of today and tomorrow. So that that way, you walk towards why were they created? Two, why were they redeemed? Three, why, what are the gifts and callings of the Lord inside of them? And four, what is their specific role in the congregation and in the wider body? With these four questions, a pastor can get to work. Not looking at the people as statistic, but looking at them as real people. Not just people redeemed by the blood. Not just people, sons of Elohim with his DNA. And you see yourself as on a special assignment to be used by Holy Spirit to mold them to be that very, very vessel of honor the Father has ordained them to be. Men and brethren, it's awesome. Tomorrow we'll continue. Pray for us. Pray for Pastor Grace and I that this assignment will do it till the very end. That it will please the Father to sustain us in soundness of health. And with our children, the Father's grace and mercy shall be our portion. That we will be used by Him to help our brothers and sisters across Africa, across Asia, across Europe, across North America, across South America, across the islands of the Pacific, across the islands of the Atlantic, across the islands of the Indian Ocean, to come to the fullness of divine purpose. That's our joy. That's our assignment. And when we see those who are on the track, as we've seen a number of places, those who are going towards it, it brings us great pleasure. We love you dearly. Please share this. Would you share can we try to share this to as many people as possible? Share it. Discuss it. And then write something on the thread. Let us know what we share today. Did it resonate in your heart? Did you feel that you are more empowered? You are more enlightened? Do you feel that it points to something in you? Something in you stirred up that nobody may have known, nobody may have seen. And you need help? You let us know. We have over 50 mentors across the world. As a matter of fact, when we integrate the 2017 masterclass, we'll probably be up to 70 mentors who are available. And Pastor Grace and I are here. That's all we do. To supply resources, to break down these things, and to encourage the emergence of five-fold assemblies all over the world. He didn't give one-fold. He didn't give two-fold. He gave the three-fold. It's not four-fold. It's five-fold. Let the five offices Arise, the mega church will manifest. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you are doing in our midst. Thank you for your grace. Thank you for with you, all things are possible. I pray that everyone whom you've called to be a pastor, Father, will embrace the truth of what you are releasing. And the truth will set them free from every error. And the truth will reformat their minds and transform their hearts so that they can be pastors after your heart. 
Lord, give us pastors after your heart. Give it to the body across the world. Enable us to apprehend all that you are giving to us. I pray that there will be no heart that will harden the bouncing of your word. Plow, your, plow the heart of everyone with, this, with, with, the, with the Holy Spirit and with the blood of the Lamb. Thank you for answering our prayer. Let this teaching video go forth now and be used by you in a mighty way. We thank you for in Yeshua's name we pray. Amen and amen.